Okay, welcome everyone to our April Presynaptic Project Workshop. Today we're going to be learning about depth cues with our workshop I Spy. This workshop was actually created by me, um, and I'm very, very lucky to present it here today with a good friend of mine, Erin from Simply Neuroscience. Hello, everybody. Erin, do you want to head on to the next slide? Awesome. Okay, so I will start by introducing myself, I guess. Um, my name is Gerlein. I uh, live in Canada and at SN, I am the co-lead of the Presynaptic Project, which is this initiative right here. Um, I'm joined here with a couple of other SN members, so I'm going to give them uh, a chance to introduce themselves. We can start with you, Erin. Hello, everybody. My name is Erin. I'm coming at you from Los Angeles, California in the US, and I'm in a couple departments at SN, including our reach and research, which includes this wonderful PSP team. So really happy to be here. Also part of the editing team and then also bring resource creation, which creates resources for uh, free educational neuroscience resources for kids just like you. And then Elisa. I'll pass the torch on to, yeah, Elisa. Hi everyone, I'm Elisa, I'm from Maryland, and at SN I have been working on the presynaptic project for quite a while, and for this month I will be your virtual coordinator for the challenge. Oh yes, uh, Elisa has a very exciting challenge to share with you guys at the end of the presentation. Uh, Paige, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi guys, I'm Paige, I'm from a little outside of Philly in the United States, and I am the co-director of outreach and research at SN, and I have the awesome job of getting to oversee and help coordinate this with Gerlene and the rest of the team. Thanks, Paige. And last but not least, we have my wonderful co-lead here, Divya. She's doing some of the back end stuff today. Uh, Divya, do you wanna introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Divya. I'm another co-lead of the Presynaptic Project. And yeah, these workshops are really, really exciting. So I hope you all enjoy. Okay, awesome. So I think that's everybody on our team. We're actually going to get into uh, the content that we're going to be learning today. So as you guys know, today's workshop is called I Spy Depth Cues, and it's all about how we see. Um, I see somebody has their hand raised. If you have a question, just put it in the chat and we'll try to answer it as we go along. Um, but the question is, how do we see? You might think we just see with our eyes, but the information in our eyes actually has to go somewhere to be interpreted. So there's actually a very cool um, system that we're actually going to be going through today with how what you see in your eyes ends up being images and understanding in your brain. So we actually see with both our eyes and our brains. The eyes are sensory organs because they gather information from the environment. So you might see a window, you might see a certain color, but how do you identify what that color is? How do you identify what the object you're seeing or who that person that you're seeing across the street, how do you know who that is? Well, all that information from your eyes is processed in the brain's visual cortex, which is right here at the back of your head. And once it's interpreted, we're, we're able to kind of make sense of what we're seeing. All right, so what exactly is the first organ that, that receives all this visual information that goes, ends up going to the back of your head to your visual cortex. Well, this organ is called the human eye. I'm sure you've heard of it. We all have two of them. And there are several different uh, parts of the eye, including the lens, the people, and the iris, some of which you might've heard of some of these vocab terms. And all of these things, all these parts work together to interpret any image that we might see in the world. And then not only the image itself, but depth and, and the color of it, the size of it. So, and then not only certain objects, but the entire world around us, which is insane because that is a lot of information. So this is what the human eye looks like and some of the different parts are labeled, but what do all of these parts actually do? Okay, so, so oh, go ahead. <laughs> sorry. So, that leads us to our first activity. It's called iNatomy and it'll be a group activity. And so we will divvy you all up into groups and each group will be assigned about one or two parts of the human eye, depending on our groups. And then using the information in your neuro notebooks, each group will be responsible for creating about one slide uh, per each part of the eye to explain some things about it, like its, its function and its location and different things like that. And then you'll also be able to draw it and then we'll put that information onto the slide. And then once we're all back here in the main session, 
we'll ask for a couple of volunteers. So any brave soldiers who want to share uh, what they put on their slide. And that would be awesome. So yeah. All right. Let's see what you all have created. Okay, let's see the first slide. Uh, does anyone want to share who created this slide? Um, yeah, I created this slide. I can share. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the slide I completed was the iris. Um, the iris is located near the pigmented muscle toward the front of the eye itself. Uh, the iris is the color portion of the eye, which makes you you. It's unique to yourself. Um, the iris uses muscles to change the size of the pupil during different variations of light and dark. So you know how like your pupil like expands or gets really small during like a lot of light or when it's like completely dark? But that's what the iris does. And it also just looks very pretty. Um, the iris is unique to everyone. It's like a curtain in front of your eyeball shaded with colors chosen from your genetics. So um, the iris is chosen from uh, different pairs of genetics from both your mom and your dad. And um, a lot of the times it can be really unique just to you. Very cool. Thanks, Morgan. Uh, can we see the next slide, please? Yes. Okay. Uh, whoever did this slide, if you want to share. Um, I, I, I did not do that slide, but then um, I got the Google Doc. So I did the pupil and I can present it. Yes. Awesome. Let's hear it. Where is it located? The pupil is a black hole located in the center of the iris of the eye. What does it look like? The pupil is a black circle located in the center of the iris, which is the colored part of your eye. Fun fact, your pupils are similar to a camera aperture. What does it do? The pupil is the hole that passes light to the retina, the light sensitive layer of the back of your eye. And there is a picture here which shows the pupil. Okay, awesome. Uh, let's see the next slide. Okay, so this is the cornea. Uh, does anyone want to share this one? I can share. Um, so the cornea is a layer on top of the eye in which light enters, and it looks like a gray shield-like attachment to the anterior chamber and the iris. Um, it helps to bend and focus light rays, and it also protects the eye from dust. And that is our picture over there, and it's like the gray-like shield. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Does anyone I can share again? Okay. <laughs> um, so this the lens is a structure located inside the eye behind the iris. It looks like a see-through bubble-like structure. Did she cut out for you too? Yeah, I believe so. Uh, does somebody else want to finish up this slide? Maybe the SN member who was in the group? Yeah, I can do that. All right, um, I'll just take it from the top again. So the lens is located inside the eye behind the iris. It's basically the see-through bubble that's um, behind the pupil of the eye. And in the image, it you can see that like bubble sort of, um, structure behind the pupil. Uh, in reality, it isn't a bubble at all, though. It is, it's more of like a curved structure because it's a lens. Um, so it is quite fragile, uh, but it does look like a bubble in the image. And the function of the lens is to bend and change shape to focus light rays onto the retina, or in other words, it's called accommodation. And that's the picture. Perfect, thank you for sharing. Um, here's the retina. So uh, this is my group. So the retina is located at the back of the eye. And if you imagine like light rays going through your eye, they kind of meet or converge on the retina. So the retina is a thin layer of tissue and it has two types of cells called rods and cones. Um, one of these is responsible for seeing color and fine detail. The other one's responsible for uh, black and white and like shapes. Um, I, I can't remember off the top of my head which one is which, but I really do encourage you guys to maybe do that Google search on your own. 
Um, as you can see in the image, we have the retina and there's lots of different types of uh, receptor cells there like ganglion cells and bipolar cells, which you will definitely learn up, about if you take uh, biology or neuroscience in high school or university. Uh, but for now, we are just focusing on rods and cones and that's the picture. All right, so this is my groups. Uh, we covered the optic nerve. So it's located in the back of the eye, as you can see in the picture, and it goes straight to the visual cortex. And it resembles a sponge, and uh, at least in the picture that we had in the original slideshow. And the texture looks a bit fibrous. It, it was also, um, but in, in this picture, it does look a bit different. So it looks more like wires or something like that. And then as for its function, it sends visual information taken in by the frontal structures that we just covered, like the lens and such of the brain. And then they send it to the visual cortex to go through its first stage of processing. And yeah, and that's the picture. And, <laughs> and the then... last one, oh, my group did this one. So the blind spot is located at the back of the eye um, and there's no receptor cells there um, because if the image kind of forms or converges on that part, of your eye, then you can't really perceive it. No image forms. And so if you've ever noticed your parents or siblings or like a bus driver or a taxi driver driving, before they change lanes, they always look over their shoulder. And the reason why is they can't really see what's here because that's in their blind spot. So they have to turn their head um, to see what's actually there before they make a move. I think that's all for the eye anatomy activity. Thank you guys all so much for your participation. We really do appreciate you guys taking the risk and stepping up and being comfortable speaking in front, um, up in front of your peers. Erin, um, can we go back to the main slideshow? Yes. Um, can I say right something now. real quick, if you don't mind? Sure. Okay. So um, I know online for everybody who's interested in learning about the eye and the multiple parts, um, I've done a course from Duke University called Perception uh, of the Brain, and it talks about the different cones and how the different receptors affect like how we see things and how what we actually take in isn't really what we're seeing in our mind. Very cool. So that's another resource um, for you guys to check out. Can we go to the next slide, Erin? Yeah. So we're not going to play this video um, because I think we went through all the parts of the eye pretty well. Um, but if you need a recap, uh, when you're looking at the slideshow after, we are going to post this PowerPoint and feel free to watch this video again. Um, it has some really good visuals, but just in the interest of time to make sure we can cover all the content today, we're just going to keep moving. Okay, so we're now we're going to start talking about depth cues. So depth cues are basically pieces of information received by either one eye or both, and they help us perceive how far or how close objects are. That's what depth is. They help us basically interpret 3D shapes from 2D images that form on our retina. So when you think of retina they see think of your retina you see like a picture like a photograph but how do you know that something's 3d even though it forms a 2d image well that's why depth cues are so important and we're actually going to start talking a little bit more about them all right so the first type of depth cue that we're going to cover today is binocular so right off the bat you might think binocular i'm pretty sure i've heard that word before well you might be thinking of binoculars which is kind of the um, that object I use to see something from a really far distance. So binocular itself means using both eyes. And if you think back to the binoculars, you do use both eyes and information from both of those, both of your eyes in order to perceive that far away image. And so, and even if you break it down further, by means two normally. Uh, and then, so binocular depth cues rely on information from both eyes to receive visual information to be processed. And so, one specific type of binocular depth cue is called retinal disparity, and this helps us perceive distance. So even, even then, if you think back to binoculars, this is the perceived distance. It's an image really far away. And then each eye interprets a slightly different image of the same object, and the greater the difference between those two images, the closer the object is. So if you close, let's say close your right eye, and then you open it back up and close your left eye, and or even, especially if you do that quickly, then you're gonna see two different images, even though you know, you're perceiving one certain like, environment, if you will. So pretty cool. And um, then is there a thing called monocular? No. You're on the right track, yes. And we're actually gonna get to that. So stay tuned. 
Okay, yeah. So we're going to move on to another fun activity that you guys can actually all do at the same time. This is a really fun one. I found it in my psych textbook last year and I was pretty amazed by it. So what you guys are going to do is hold your fingers kind of like this about half an inch apart. I'm Canadian. I don't know what an inch is, but you know, just, just a little bit of distance between the two. Uh, and you want to slowly bring your uh, fingers away from your face. So like about this far. And then you want to look beyond that little space. And what you should start to see is like this magic third finger in between. Um, do you guys want to give it a shot? And then let us know if you can see it in the chat. Yeah, was anyone else able to do it? I was definitely able to, it's pretty cool. It is pretty cool, right? Um, okay, uh, can we move on? Yeah, so that's basically what you should be able to see. So like a magic third finger, um, pretty cool. Um, and so kind of just explain what's happening here. Remember how Aaron was saying, um, your image in your right eye is different from your image in your left eye. And so basically the size of the finger decreases as the retinal disparity decreases. So the further an object is from you, the more similar the images in the two eyes look. The closer it is, you can actually do this yourself. Look at your finger from here, and then from here, there's a huge difference. Whereas if you're looking at something a little bit further, you don't see as much of a difference in either eye. And so basically what happens is when you've got your um, fingers at a certain distance, the retinal disparity is decreasing because you're moving further. And so suddenly it starts to seem like a third finger. So it's pretty cool. All right, and then moving on to what a student mentioned, monocular depth cues. So with this one, if you had the sub or the, the root word of bi, meaning two, mono is one. So monocular would, uh, depth cue of a monocular type would mean using one eye versus two. So monocular depth cues rely on information from only a one eye. And then, so today we'll be exploring five monocular depth cues and there are a lot more, but this is just um, some of the most prominent ones. And those five are relative height, relative size, interposition, linear perception, and light and shadow. So let's, let's jump into it. Okay, so the first one is relative height. So basically, we assume that uh, objects in the lower part of an image are closer, while objects that are higher in the field of view are further. So if we look at this picture here, we think that ducks are a lot closer to us because they're more towards the bottom of the picture. And we assume that the trees in the house is further away because it's at the top of the picture. So even though this is a 2D image, we're able to pursue, uh, perceive the relative height of the objects in the picture. And then jumping off of that, something that's kind of similar, uh, except it's with size, is that when two objects are the same size, we assume that the one that appears smaller is actually just farther away. So if you look at the image and the, the black ball is perceived to be bigger, but that's, that's essentially because it's closer. So the perceived distance um, is, is lesser. And so the object itself is perceived as larger. And then the farther away objects are perceived as smaller. But in reality, they're the same exact size. This uh, little exercise you can do if you don't have a full table, which is kind of a, a rare, rare thing. You could put like two fruits or maybe say apples on the counter. And then you can place one closer to you in your line of vision and then one farther away. Two apples of the same size, that's important to, to note. And then if you look, if you're eye level with the counter, one might seem a lot bigger to you because it is closer and that is the relative size of it is that it's bigger because it's closer to your eyes and your perceived um, image of that object. But then if you bring them both to be next to each other, they're going to be the same exact size. So it's pretty interesting. Okay, so the next one is interposition. So if one object partially covers our view of another object, we assume that it's closer to us. Um, it sounds a little bit confusing, but this image is perfect. You can see the the tan circle blocks part of the red square. So we assume that the circle is closer to us than the square. Same thing for the triangle, the red, tri the red square blocks the green triangle. And so we assume that the square is closer to us than the triangle and that's called interposition. All right, and then moving on to linear perspective. So this one, I'm sure you all have had 
a lot of experience with if you've ever sat in the passenger seat of, of your parents' car. So essentially parallel lines appear to get closer or converge in the distance. And then the sharper they meet, uh, the further the perceived distance. So as you can see with the road, it's not actually becoming narrower. It's as you go along, it'll stay roughly the same size, but as it's farther away, the parallel lines are perceived to get closer together and eventually touch when this is not actually the case, the road is just really long. So that's, that's how our, our brain perceives that image because it is so far away. So it appears to get closer when in reality, it'll, it'll stay as it is closer to your, to your field of vision in the original moment, if that makes sense. <laughs> Okay, and the last one is light and shadow. This one's a little bit difficult um, to explain, but basically shading creates depth and we, which supports our assumption that all light comes from above. So we always assume like the sun is on top of us. So in this case, um, do you think the smaller circle caves in or sticks out? Let us know um, in the chat, what do you think? Do you think this smaller circle is sticking out or caving in? Yeah, it, it does look like it sticks out, right? Because the light is coming from above. Erin, uh, can you press next? But then we have another image. In this case, does this one look like it's sticking out or that it's caving in? Yeah, so this one looks like it's caving in. And the reason why is we kind of always assume that light comes from the top, right? Like the sun. Um, so in the first case, we assume it's sticking out because the sun is kind of illuminating the top of it. But then we assume it's caving in because the sun is hitting this part of it. So that's called light and shadow. It's a uh, pretty cool illusion. All right, next slide. Okay, so some of you guys did anticipate correctly. You're doing a cahoot. Let's get started. So we'll cover monocular depth cues. So essentially you'll see an image and then you have to, yeah, you'll see an image and then you'll have to know which monocular depth cue it is. You don't have a ton of time, so hurry, hurry, hurry. Awesome. Nice job, everyone. Nice. All right, moving on. We got this. Hurry. Very awesome. We got the majority of you getting, getting it right. Any changes? Oh, we got some healthy competition here. All right, which depth cue does Fong image represent? Got to go quickly. Awesome. Oh. You guys got that one right. All right. Nice job. Nice. Yeah, some people with streaks over here. Very awesome. Nice job. Awesome. That is so awesome, guys. Good job. Everyone got that one. That's awesome. Great work, guys. That is fantastic. Last. What is it? Why was I last? No, that's OK. You still got half the game. Yes, still a ton of time. You got this. Awesome. All right, all right, the majority. I was still fifth. Oh, healthy competition. Very awesome. All right, which one does this image represent? Yes. Good job, guys. That one was a hard one. That's good. You all are learning. This is awesome. All right, which one would this one represent? Maybe think back to the road. Awesome. And then even if you're not getting some of these right, it's all part of the learning process and I'm sure you'd get it very right the next time. All right, this one was on our slideshow. Do y'all remember which one this was? 
Most of you, let's go. Awesome. And even if you didn't get it, that is awesome. You would you definitely get it right the second time. So you are learning, All right? Which one? Gotta go quickly. Yes, awesome. Okay, last question. Let's see if anyone can take the lead. Any healthy competition? Let's see. This one's a tougher one. Mm -hmm. you, still, you still have to go quickly. <laughs> Wow, uh, yeah, that was very a tough close, one. very close. Quick, good job, everyone. All right, let's see. In third place with AI 10. Awesome, awesome. Somebody did take the lead. Well, let's see. Woo! Morgan, let's awesome. go. Congratulations, guys. Those are really, really good scores. Yes, that is, that is actually amazing. Awesome job. All right. And then going back to our slideshow. Yeah. All right. So congratulations to the winners. Awesome job, you learned a lot. And congratulations to all of you who participated. Those were some tough questions and you all got a ton of them right. So awesome job. Okay, so the last so, kind of concept. I'm oh. oh, sorry to cut you off there, Aaron. It's all good. Uh, the last uh, concept we want to teach you guys before we let you go today is perceptual constancy. And so basically what that is, is that despite the fact that our view of an object changes, we know that it's the same object. It still has the same color, shape, and size. So like even in the dark, you don't assume that um, like a stuffed toy, a teddy bear turned to a darker color. You know that it's still the same bright blue. It's still the same shape, even if you can't see it properly in the dark. Um, if here's a great example with the door. You can see that as the door opens, the shape goes almost to look like a trapezoid. It doesn't really look very rectangular anymore, but you don't think that the door shape is changing. You just know that your view of it is a little bit different as the door opens. And that's perceptual constancy. You know that the object actually stays the same. All right. Oh, oh. you missed the last slide. My bad. No worries. There we go. <laughs> okay, um, we have Elisa here. She's gonna talk a little bit about um, the challenge for this month. Yeah. So the challenge for this month is about depth cues. And each of you guys will be responsible to find two images that represent depth cues around you and write a really short description about um, which depth cue it represents and how um, the depth cue is shown in the image. And in the worksheet that's on Classroom, you can, um, there are examples there, so you can um, use those examples to guide you. And you can also refer back to this uh, Google slide and maybe in the Kahoot if you guys um, for extra examples if you need help. Um, and yeah, so try to be creative with these and we're excited to look at your submissions. Sounds good. Uh, that's already posted on Google Classroom for you guys to get started on. All right. And that brings us to the end of today's workshop. Thank you guys so much for tuning in um, and listening. We always love to hear your enthusiasm and your participation. Um, please, 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 if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask them now, put them in the chat, or uh, you can attend our office hours, which is going to be next week, um, where we can give you some feedback uh, on your virtual challenge submissions. And we can also answer any questions you have one-on-one. -on -one.